Bum bum. Hello everyone. How are we all doing? So, here is the common response video. As always, I have picked the video which last week got the most uh, most comments. Now, it's kind of interesting because I always consider the patron videos which have a live and then a long patrol, so they have both a recorded video and a live, uh, to be sort of treat them as one video. And that caused this to be sort of combined because in terms of comments, let's see. The live, that just got a standard amount of comments. You know, it's uh, Epic Blunders of Naval History got a thousand views since it's aired and it's had 14 comments. So about 1% of people comment. Please, more people comment. It gives me more things to respond to in these common response videos. <laughs> Ask questions. <laughs> Say hi. <laughs> I'm not above begging. <laughs> I like doing comment response videos. They're fun ones. That <sighs> It's going to sound strange. If the recorded videos are lectures and the lives are seminars, then the comment response videos are kind of the, like the sessions when I sit at the end of a class and I'm just chatting away with the students as they're leaving and they're supposed to be going off to other lectures or free time or whatever they're going to do and instead they're coming up and asking me questions. Yeah, I am getting the university experience via YouTube. I realise I am. I make no shame about this. I enjoy it. <laughs> it's my substitute for not having as much university teaching as I'd like. I'd like to be a full-time tenured lecturer and still keep up the YouTube stuff because honestly modern academia is not the most reliable income stream known to mankind. But anyway, so that was the live. It got 14 comments, but... The Long Patrol, the recorded video, got 55. And so, combined together, in their total, that is 69. And 69 wins, because the other video which was up that week was the Abruzzi class, which only got 29. And I, 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 I still have no idea what is going to lead to a lot of comments with you all because the other one which I was considering doing a response to, uh, doing a response on, was of course the US Treaty Crew, uh, the comment response to the Brooklyn class comment response. Because it got 33 and I was going, well, eh, hang on. Is that getting, uh, is that going to beat it? It didn't beat the Epic Blunders though. So the Epic Blunders got higher, so we go for those two. That's, that's a combined one. But no, I, I do look through the videos. It's like, this week I'm recording this, and already the Daedalus class Stargate Battlecruisers has got 65 comments. And it's only had 682 views. So A, lots of people viewing it. Thank you. B, only 65, uh, 65 comments. That's that's doing quite well already. There have been some very interesting ones. I have to admit there was one which was that they think the thing was the Air Force viewed these ships not as battle cruisers when they built them, but as heavy bombers. They would go in, make a strike, and then pull out. And sort of do a planty strike and leave. And they evolve into battle cruisers because... That's the role they end up having to fulfill because that's the realistic role. And I was reading it and going... I'd forgotten I'd thought that years ago, but you've just made that point and that's really interesting. Because that... I then went back to some notes I'd made years ago when I was first watching them. And one of the notes I had was, do they think this is a heavy bomber, not a, not a, not a ship? It does explain a lot, if they do think it is a heavy bomber, rather than a ship. But, um, no. Other point I have to make, while I'm, before I start answering questions, there have been some WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp scam comments put in on my videos with people pretending to be me. I have changed all my passwords. 
I have played whack-a-mole spam reporting with them. Hopefully that has dealt with the problem. If it doesn't, please tell me. I will never be suggesting you do uh, fin get financial advice or send messages to WhatsApp or anything like that. I do not run that kind of system. I do have a Discord server for this channel that people can ask me questions on, as well as Patreon, and as, of course, comment response. So there are lots of ways you can communicate with me, and I will happily respond and answer questions and try and be of help. Because, as said before, I do this because I love sharing love of history, and because, honestly, the other advantage of it, and don't take this the wrong way, this is something which a book addict will feel. I get books sent to me to review now. They don't have to come via journals, so writing articles, they get sent directly to me. Don't take this the wrong way, but my family thinks this is really, really bad news because it was bad enough when the book addiction was dependent upon my earning power. Now it's just dependent on me pressing click and going, yes, I will review and put a review of it on my channel. <laughs> I mean, there's one here which I'm really, really looking forward to reviewing at. It'll be in Sunday's um, Brew Ships. Naval Eyewitnesses, The Experiences of War, 1939-1945, James Goulty. Really, really cool. And, but before I get, also, the other announcement, before I get into this, um, I have already said I've been going through some issues with my car and it's ended up me having to get a new car. Which has delayed one part of the computer build because, first of all, the camera which I was going to get went out of stock, and then by the time it came back in stock, the car needed to be replaced. And it's a case of, yes, the camera, a new camera is going to come, and it's a gimbal stabilized thing which will hopefully deal with some of the issues, but also where it'll be positioned is going to deal with some issues because when it comes, it's going to be positioned. Instead of the cameras currently here, the camera will end up being positioned over there and will change the aspect of the room to viewing it from this perspective. Probably, he says, probably. But now I've realized I've got two screens and when I look at that one which has my notes on and this one which has the camera and all the screen portrayed, which is the sort of stuff I'm working on, on um, things could look strange. Because if I'm looking at this screen, I look like I'm looking out of the picture, to that side. If I look at this screen, I look like I'm looking out to that side. I'm going to have to work this one out at some point. Because also, I don't want to be staring directly down the camera at you all the whole time, because I have been told that feels a bit weird by students on... Uh, what do you call it? Well, to be fair, on Zoom, but that wasn't the one they told me on. It was the MS Teams. Yes. 90% of universities seem to use it. Anyway, to the questions. And we'll start off with the ones from the live, which was Patreon 64, Epic Blunders and No History. We'll start off with the first question, so going back to the other one. Um, nice to go for everyone. Think you're going to have to bribe that cousin of yours to help. Have to correct a poor choice of words. The bribe has been sent, i.e. The, the amount of chocolate has been supplied. So now I'm adding to my monthly bill, supplying a 12-year-old. Please note, the cousin who's helping me is 12. She's very efficient, but she's 12. And I am paying her, in terms of pocket money, hmm... She doesn't actually want cash. She's getting a box of micro machines, which I'm tracking down for her. I'm helping her with painting some of her um, space marines, which will slow me getting around to ordering my own and painting my own space marines. Because I need to paint a new set so I can be happy with the colours before I start repainting all my other ones, because I'm changing units to... Uh, I'm changing to iron walls from... Templars. I, one of my cousins now has a Templar force, so I'm changing my force. 
Yes, I'm geeky. Uh, not this cousin. That's another cousin. And um, a large box of Maltesers. And when I say a large box, I'm not talking a box that size. I'm talking bit, the big box of Maltesers. Every month. And in return, she's going through comments and checking them for me to check if I've missed any questions from people like and putting them into an Excel spreadsheet and she's doing that twice a month just checking them up and checking the spreadsheet for me and I did offer more but that was what she wanted because she thought it thinks it's helping family so you know just being asked. probably as she gets older she's going to end up wanting more but also that's me is I am going to be very strict on comments if my little 11 year old cousin is the one going through and checking comments because she wants to do it I am going to be watching comments for swear words I'm not enforcing a no swear policy because she spent enough time around members of the Navy and various other things that she probably does know the words despite her age sorry if her mum's watching this I know her mum knows the words and but if it is too much you can, there is the we all know there's the acceptable amount there's the one which when someone does one word in the middle of a cafe and then quickly goes quiet no 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 and there's the full tyra uh, full rant the full rant will get deleted because i'm not having her read that so just please remember that if you see comments like that etc just remember that please 11 year old I, I was angling for one of the elder cousins to do it but she was the one who really wanted to do it so she's doing it I'll also include a bottle of iron brew in the supplies I send her it's good to feed the addiction when it's young Anyway, let's start off with the questions. Prop ones. Marcus Fransonium. Hello, I do love your name. The Battle of Camperdown. Well, that is the interesting part, as there have been a bit of a re regime change from the Dutch Republic to the Batavian Republic, and they had a bit of a, a bit of a, a habit of a bad a bit of replacing the officers that were loyal to the new regime, and where they were more competent sailors and officers loyal to the old Republic left voluntarily or forcefully, leaving the Batavian Republic Navy were very undermanned and very less capable officers. It's well worth a read on Batman Republic because it's a piece of forgotten European history. There is so many issues. But the fact is also, I am not quite sure I would say that the people who were there, who were left, were bad officers. They weren't as good officers, but it's a kind of case of, you are lucky in that you have some rather brilliant officers who could have maybe pulled off the impossible. But the officers you're left with are still better than probably the officers in the French and the Franco and the Spanish navies at this point. Probably. They have, certainly have a lot more experience. That's it. Yeah, going to be cutting down the number of questions I repair ahead of brew ships from 15 to 10. It's trying to think of 15 questions is difficult. You could always send in the questions as suggestions to the 60 second videos. I'm going to be recording those while I'm away in November. The plan is to do a load of recordings before I go away for the long uh, for the recorded videos. And then while I'm away and traveling, especially in the second week when I'm away doing TV stuff and research stuff, um, is to record a whole load of 60 second videos. So the, the plan is that every day of Christmas, for the Christmas period, which I'm defining as the 1st of December to, let me let me check the, the final decision. It's the Christmas period that I'm running is going to run from the 1st of December to the 8th of January. And my aim will be to have a, either a live or a recorded video every day for that period. So for the 1st of December to the 8th of January, there'll be a live or recorded video every single day coming out at seven o'clock in the evening. 
UK time. I'd also like to have a 60 second video coming out at 7am in the morning, which is why I haven't been producing any, because I'm basically recording and saving them. So any ideas, gratefully received, and I'll put them together into the 60 second videos, because currently, because that means I need to produce 39. I currently have 7. So, I'm kind of short. And the reason I'm doing that is because I do it every year I do something like this. I do I do Twitter storm of articles and all those sort of things. And uh, the reason I do that is because I had a few years ago a couple of friends who were basically very, very lonely. And at different times they had this. And um, they'd come back from a very intensive job, let's say. Very intensive work. And they ended up being alone at the Christmas period, which I found incredibly annoying because if I'd realised it, they would have been drummed, in, drummed into my family Christmas because I strongly disagree with people coming back from, let's say, that kind of very intensive work period and then being alone over Christmas. I do not think it's sensible. There are times a year where being alone really, really sucks. It's never fun, but there are times when it's worse. Anyway, I always did, and always do do, a Christmas calendar sort of thing with my articles. And both of them, it's a different areas, remarked that reading the articles and having them come out gave them something to do, which stopped them thinking about being on their own and watching YouTube videos and having the new stuff come out stopped them feeling so bad. So every year, now I do the YouTube channel etc all this stuff, I basically give myself a, a humongous amount of work because if I can help one person who's on their own in that sort of period, doing that sort of thing, then it's worthwhile. I don't care. It might help no one. In which case, well, I've not lost nothing. But if it helps one person, it's worth it. So that is what I am doing. So that is why over those 39 days, There will be literally videos coming out every single day. <laughs> I'm gonna kill myself. I, I mean, that, 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 with work, with work, please note, with work, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I can do that on this video, I, I can do this on the, this computer, will do it. Uh, but no, <laughs> seriously. And the list of them is includes um, a three-part series on the Soviet Navy, which will include, and then a fourth part, which will be uh, the live. Um, it'll be the Soviet. It'll be start off with the first of December. Will be German heavy cruisers of World War Two, which will be a live. Then the long patrol for that will be the Saturday. Then of course there's brewship uh, this, and then on the Friday it'll start off the Soviet Navy, nineteen eighteen to nineteen thirty nine. Uh, then it's the Comus class protected corvette, the Kaida class, the Cresta class. Uh, then it's Patron 68, whatever that is. Then it's going to be the Soviet Navy, 1939 to 1965, on Friday the 9th of December. Uh, then it's going to be whatever the Patron 68's long patrol is. Then it's Brew Ships 96. Then it's HMCS Sackville, hopefully special, once we've got all the footage together. Uh, Calypso class protected Corvette on the 13th. Um, USS Wichita on the 14th. Uh, Soviet Navy 1965 to 91 on the 16th. Um, Patron 69, of course, is the 15th, 17th. Brew Ships 97 is the 9th, is the 9th, 18th. Yeah. Uh, HMS Warrior. Kara class, Slava class, and USS Long Beach make up the 19th to 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Soviet Navy 1981 18 to 1991 alive is the 
3rd of December. That's going to be the last live before Christmas. The Saturday, the 24th, will be uh, the Ottoman Venetian War, 1499 to 1503, because I just thought I would. Uh, then it's HMCS Haida, which is going to be the 25th of December. Then it's the Albany class on the 26th of December, the Lehi class on the 27th, the Belknap class on the 28th, the 1860 to 1960, 100 years of gun cruisers live is on the 29th, US nuclear powered cruisers on the 30th, Tikaronga class cruisers on the 31st, Brew Ships 98 on the 1st, that's 1st of January. Then it's US Treaty Cruisers in War and Retrospect on the 2nd. And then it's the start of the New Year specials. <sighs> Which are going to be fun. Include, of course, on the 5th, the Live of the Battle of Coronel. And it's going to, the first recorded video, there's going to be the Long Patrol on the 3rd, is going to be the Long Patrol recorded video of um, the 100 Years of Gun Cruisers, because I that's plenty of technology stuff is going to be included in that. Uh, so for it to be both a sort of a fitting link between, like the US Treaty Cruisers in War and, Re War and Retrospect, is a sort of, those are fitting linking pieces between the year of the cruiser and the year of technology. Deciding on completely, I've got seven different options put together for the last, for the fourth, sixth and seventh, and I've got to pick, so to take it down to three. <laughs> oh, we'll see what I come up with. Anyway, that is that. So if you have any extra questions, that would make good 60 second videos, shorts. Please do send them in because I need the help. I'm being honest here, I need the help. Eric O'Kan, um, one of the most epic blunders in Naval history, the loss of the flagship Royal Regal Cronan, the crown and the subsequent defeat of the entire fleet, 1st of June 1676. Cronan rolled over by the wind with her gun ports open, leading to water coming in, much like what happened to Vasa in 1628. Cannons and men started rolling, falling all over each other. The powder magazines were ignited, and the entire starboard side blew up. 800 crew perished, including Admiral Lawrence Krutz. A collective lack of competence among the officers and men is believed to be the cause of a series of mishaps leading to the loss. The loss of all three regal ships, Rechflat, Rechavat, and the Apple and the Sword of State. You, they call the ship the Apple and the Sword of St the Apple Rex Apple. You call the ship the Apple. I've got to do more study on that ship name. You call the ship the Apple? The Apple? Okay. Effectively put Sweden out of control of the Baltic, opening for, uh, for a Danish invasion of Scan Scandinavia to reclaim the lands for the Danish. <sighs> it's, it's fun. Stafford, good luck with the beef Wellington. I understand it is complicated. Hope it went well. Flight second, Germany could not be build a ship comparable to Yamamoto as they didn't have the infrastructure, as you said. They could have built the infrastructure. That's the main interesting thing. If the, if Yamamoto had existed, the uh, sheer amount of money which would have suddenly been spent by people, in terms of if they known before Japan joined the war, if Japan had announced. When, in sort of 1941, at some point, they'd suddenly displayed into the world and put their stats out. Ah, uh, let's say, in May 1941? They would have caused an absolute panic. There's always that question which comes up. You don't force your opponent in to make a mistake. You force them into dilemmas, where neither of their options are good options. Well, if you know on the world stage... 
that Japan is building this super powerful battleship, everyone is forced into a dilemma. Into multiple dilemmas. Because there is no good option. Do you build the ships you are building anyway, which you know are outclassed, especially in the UK, 14-inch guns, and the Japanese have an 18-inch gun battleship? In the nicest way, there would be... Henderson would have probably risen from the dead and gone, I TOLD YOU! Let alone what else... Uh, Nelson would be fine. He'd just be going, oh, the politicians. But St. Vincent would have risen from the dead and be stalking into the Admiralty office going, What have you done to my fleet? Goodness knows what Fisher would have done. Probably burrowed through the earth and turned up in Japan. And leaving that to one side. Pretty much... That is what Yamato should have done. They should have done with the Yamato uh, and Masashi because they would have immediately forced that dilemma on everyone. On the Americans, the British, even the Italians would have been going. Can you imagine? El Duce? El Duce's face? Sir! The Japanese, the people you write off as idiots, who actually know how to run a carrier force, but no one would actually tell him that. And actually could build us, a, could we could provide a decent design for a carrier if we bothered to, and an idea for how to run a decent flight deck, instead of this stupid idea we picked up from the Germans, which is going to cause endless trouble. No, 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 instead of that, they build a battleship, they're building a battleship with 18-inch guns. The man would have been apoplectic. Goodness knows what would happen to Hitler. Stalin would have also been interesting. Stalin would have been really interesting because, well, let's be honest, the man spent years wanting to build a battle fleet primarily because of the Japanese, who he was sure were an existential threat. If in the middle of fighting a war against the Germans for survival. He hears that Japan are building the biggest battleships known to mankind. That man would have executed every single person who said, do not build a super battleship. They would have started work immediately. That thing would have been built before he died. There would have been, literally would have been Soviet battleships. The age of the battleship would not have ended with Vanguard. The age of the battleship would have, you know, would not have ended with the building of the Vanguard. There would have been a next generation of battleships because there would have been Soviet battleships to deal with, which would have had massive guns. Whether or not they worked, we will leave that to we will leave that to that version of history, that particular part of history, to understand and work out. It wouldn't have mattered though if they worked or not. The fact they had them with guns would have meant that the Allies would have had to build their own equivalents. There just wouldn't have been an option. It would have brought in a second new age of battleships. Goodness knows what the modern navies of the world would look like. It's a whole different world. Knights of Clayton The Empire Cruise is basically how to do deterrence with a surface capital ship in the 20th century. Yeah. Anyone notice what the British did when they got the Queen Elizabeth working? What was the first thing the British did with the Queen Elizabeth? Send it pretty much around the world, right? Yeah. Build a task group around it, send it around the world to say, Hello, we're here. Now, admittedly, that was decades of sensible work going in, and we do have the current governments we have, and all the issues that they are. But it's nice to know that there is equipment there for when... Eventually, potentially, myself and Drak Innerfell finally decide that we are going to pursue the policy of forming our own political party and getting elected. To be called Ship Sensible Party, or the name to be supplied yet. Who knows? I would have to actually persuade him to go the democratic way, but we, will, we could achieve this. And then sensibly run the country according to naval historians. Because, as we all know, naval historians really know how to run a country. We have generations of naval history behind us. 
Nice children, the American Standard Battleships would still be useful to have around, even if outclassed by Amazon. They'd still be useful, but just picture this. You are the congressman who is out telling people how great the US Navy is, and someone goes, but, sir, our battleships have this gun and are this old, and the Japanese have a brand new 18-inch gun battleship. Do you really consider that battleship the equal? No. Because... That's the trouble with capital ships, okay? Cruisers, you can sell them on their avatar. So you can build a light cruiser when everyone else is building a heavy cruiser and just point out, well, this is what we need the cruisers to do. So we need hull numbers, so we're building light cruisers. You can do that. You try and tell someone you're building a cat, you're deploying a capital ship, which is anything less than looks to be in the first class, you look weak. Capital ships, whether they are battleships, battle cruisers, aircraft carriers, whatever form a capital ship takes, they are a visible stand-in for the nation state. If your nation wants to be treated as a nation state and wants to project itself as being a powerful, present, capable nation, doesn't matter how many you have, it matters that you have one and that it's capable and it is first rank. It doesn't matter anything else really other than it has to be first rank it has to be first rank for it to work <sighs> richard cuts the failure of the u.s occurred to establish a convoy system in home waters and or enforce a blockade a blackout on the east coast immediately after world war ii is a defi fits the definition certainly fits the definition of a few things FWS Kurgan. Hello. There's a triple turret of the Nisenau standing in Norway. It's a great way to spend a few hours looking at. I know it's on my list of things I want to see in Norway when I finally get there. My aim is to try and to get to Norway. Oof. Well, my aim is to try and do both Norway and Australia next year. If I have the funds and if I have everything organized, that's my plans for those trips. And the reason I want to do those next year is I want to... Well, we want to go to Australia as a group again like we did Canada. And there's only going to be so many years we're able to do that before life starts causing going away as a group to be rather difficult, rather more difficult than we are. Admittedly, I'm kind of easygoing as I'm single and don't have my cousins to worry about. But they do cause me worries. And, you know, they, they haven't reached, reached, uh, they haven't reached the group where they all start marrying again. They haven't reached that sort of age band as... The ones who were sort of in the band to start getting to get married have all got through that stage and have married, mostly. Or making a conscious decision every day. You know who you are and you know I wind you up if you're watching this. And... Sorry, I have nothing but respect, but they are, every time they come, they come out with that, I just sit there and go... So do people who are married make a conscious decision every day to stay together also to leave, to not to not unalive the other person as well usually every day in my experience but leave that to one side never been married i haven't had that joy but um yeah dr clark from stafford in regards to teeth they're all there unlike mine yeah um, and I'll straighten up, unless you're on a 15-inch screen. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, I... I it's, um... I went to the dentist not that long ago, and they sort of... They were... Talking about them, and then sort of... Then I started noticing it. And it's... The trouble is, it's... It's literally too many impacts. Even with a mouth guard. In. And I used to wear them up and lower. It was fun. Mainly on the upper. I tried the lower one, it didn't really work well. And that's why the upper is quite fine. And the lower one looks like, Ah, you did take quite a large lump of a shoulder right into your mouth in on the rugby pitch. Yeah. But we won. And I got the ball off him. Leave that to one side. Um... <clears throat> Uh, I, I, I sort of makeup and the hairstyle and stuff. 
you get over it quickly when you do TV work because of the cameras they use. Um, I don't, haven't had to have a hairstylist. Uh, and makeup I've managed to keep to just powder. I don't do it on the YouTube videos. I don't. But on the TV work, I have had to. Because... You just get approached by this... It, it, it's done in such a nice way, you can't say, no, I'm British. I'm going to go, oh, oh, it's everything okay. Just need to put a little powder on the, 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 this bit. This bit's too shiny for the, the camera. So just going to put the powder on it. And just going, I, uh, uh, I, I can't say no. I'm British. <laughs> you get used to it. Anyway. Epic Blonde is a naval history. Don't worry about it. Lieutenant Kermit, uh, Kermit Tyler, USO Army Air Corps. Hmm. Darnell's Gallipoli was a blender for everyone. It was, but it didn't need to be. It didn't need to be. It could have been done. Gallipoli could have been done so much more sensible. So let's go on to the recorded, the Long Patrol videos. Right then. Uh, long Patrol videos, question, comments. There are a lot more on here. A lot more. A lot more. Jeffrey North, looking at a thumbnail. Holy... Mm. Dr. Clark is wearing a tie. This must be serious. Yes, well, it was recorded after I've been to lecture. When I go and lecture at university, I wear a shirt and tie. When I'm teaching from home, I wear a t-shirt. Mainly I wear the shirt and tie because... I am young enough that... In that scenario, if you're not wearing a shirt and tie, you can have trouble. And I'm not a tenured lecturer, so I cannot get away with as much. Colonel, Colonel, Colonel Overkill. The RN has never has a history of forgetting the Pale Sailors. The G, uh, GW pick. Depends. Are we talking about forgetting or conveniently overlooking? Um, there are issues with paying sailors. There have always been issues with paying sailors, but... The Royal Navy learnt lessons and did try to get the pay more regularly and keep watching it. The trouble is the Royal Navy tended to forget to up pay, to increase that pay. And that causes issues. I see one. How many of these can we blame on short-sighted politicians? Come on, Overkill. All of them. All of them. Sigh. I see one. Yep. George Hughes. Politicians can be blamed for most of the problems in the military. That includes flag officers who are more politicians than warriors. The trouble is, in peacetime, you're always going to get more officers rising who are more politicians than you would probably prefer. There is a reason for that. Because in peacetime, the trick to promotions is to getting noticed. That's the same in wartime. But in wartime, your warriors have ample no opportunity to get noticed because they're off fighting. But again, those might not be the warriors who want to be promoted because... I love SEALs. They are wonderful people. Do I want a SEAL to command a carrier battle group? Probably not. Unless they go off and have massive amounts of surface warfare and other parts of experience, they are probably not who I want running a battle group, a carrier battle group, because their skill set is not that area. Maybe I want them in charge of Special Operations Command. That's perfect. That's their skill set. But unless they've gone and got other experience, they're not necessarily who I want in charge of a carrier battle group. In World War II, the US Navy made a conscious effort to make sure that it always had a flying officer and a non-flying officer as chief of staff and commander of air group. Uh, they would alternate which one was which. So there was the balance of experience. The Royal Navy's most prolific carrier group commander in World War II, i.e. commanding multi-carrier operations, was a guy called Philip Vian, who started off World War II as a destroyer flotilla commander. I know, he was one of the tribal class destroyers. He ends up being 5th Sea Lord at one point, and gets, ends up being Admiral of the Fleet. He doesn't go on to become 1st Sea Lord because he's not that good at politics, but he's good at fighting and good at commanding fleets. He's both universally loved and also annoyed with, in that there are plenty of uh, fleet air on types and people from history who will complain about Philip Vian. 
The fact is, the carrier he ended up having to use as his flagship was not designed to be a flagship for the size of fleet he was commanding. And he wasn't allowed to move his flag to a cruiser, which he thought would be more sensible. However, he also earned their love because when a plane went down and he was told it was too dangerous to send a destroyer to go and pick up the air crew, he gave the orders and took his flagship to go and pick up the air crew. I.e. he drove the aircraft carrier and as such the entire task group into getting the cat into getting up that uh, picking up that pilot which caused the guy in theoretical charge of him to be really annoyed with him because he was the one who told him it's too dangerous to send a destroyer so Vian took the carrier and the guy in charge of him had to follow with him because if he didn't then the carrier would be, would be undefended so that's great, but you still need the politicians because actually you need those officers because they're the ones who need to fight your Whitehall battles for your funding. They're the ones who go and need to go and deal with the politicians to get you the funding. Let's be honest, I talk about Admiral Henderson a lot. He's got a lot of military experience. He was a very good commander, a very experienced officer. But he was also a very powerful, very capable Whitehall warrior, which meant he played politics. Being good at politics is not a bad thing. If you're a naval officer or a military officer or any kind of person, being good at politics is not a bad thing. As long as you couple it with an actual desire to learn your trade and skill and actually be good at that as well. If being good at politics is your only way to getting ahead, that is when it's bad. When it's all you're good at, that is when it's bad. But when you combine being good at politics and playing the political game, doing the study necessary to do the political stuff, as well as being good at your job, that's when you're really, really useful. Because usually being good at politics translates to, in normal terms, being good at communicating and being good at explaining what you want to be done and what needs to be done. And we need good communicators. We have never been in a time when we needed good communicators more than we are today. We have a dearth of good communicators. We are short of them in every sphere. And I sometimes think that's because politics is now viewed as such a dirty thing, people actually actively do not engage to understand how to be a good communicator. Because ultimately, that is what politicians have to be. If they want to be a successful politician, they have to be good at communication. Love them or loathe them. Look back at the most re successful recent British and American or French or Canadian politicians... And usually they're good at communication. They're good at explaining to enough people to get enough people to support their views. They're explaining in a way which enough people will support their views. So they get their votes to get elected. And then you have people going, I don't understand why this person gets elected. I don't understand. And you think they're going, because they are good at communicating and you are not. If you resort... I have to put this, I'll put this this way, with comments on the YouTube. The moment someone starts off by insulting me, I immediately go, eh, there's no point in much, really, really much further. I will probably read the whole comment. But they've pretty much lost on me, because that's not making an argument. If you were trying to make an argument by insulting people who disagree with you, you are not going to persuade them to support you. You're just not. Because think about it from your own perspective. If someone starts off their argument by calling you dumb, or by calling you, saying you don't understand something, or saying you can't understand something, or saying... This, 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 if you old people who do this are stupid or this, you lose them. You lose them. And I'm sorry, but it's base point. No matter what form of democracy you're in, the requirement is you get more people to vote for you to win. That's what you need to win. You need more people to vote for you. And people will only vote for the person who they feel, who they understand. Which means that you have to communicate with them. 
which is where politics is communication. And it's the same with promotions at work. If you're getting promoted, to get promoted at work, you have to be good at communicating and articulating what you are bringing to the company, what you are bringing to the university, what you're bringing to the organization you're in. You have to be able to tell them the story of why they should promote you because you know what you're doing. And this is why you get departments, and I see this happening in companies now and various other places. People with history degrees tend to be quite good at communicating. They tend to be good at communication skills. This is a little secret. I did, I've done a little short video where I point out that if you willingly choose a history degree and willingly try and go and practice as an academic as a historian, you're willingly cho not cho choosing the sensible financial course. Why? Because the dirty little secret of history is that actually it's a very financially lucrative career if you go and get the degree and then go and work in a, uh, work in a company. Why? Because historians tend to be taught to communicate well. We have to communicate verbally. We have to communicate in written terms. We have to gather sources and put, uh, articulate an argument. We have to put that all together. Those are good skills. Those are very transferable skills. We are absolutely ace at taking the information from people who cannot communicate well and re and rephrasing, reorganizing, putting uh, packaging it together and then presenting it. And this is why when you start to look around certain companies around the world in terms of major engineering companies and major science companies, etc., you suddenly look at the degrees of the people who are running those companies. And whilst, yes, there might be a couple there who have science and engineering degrees, there'll be a large number especially uh, sitting around them and at various senior posts in that company who have history degrees. Because it's usually easier to teach a historian enough about engineering to be able to liaise and talk with a client and other people about what you're doing than it is to try and teach most engineers to communicate. And I can say this because I teach a lot of engineers and I'm there pretty much to teach them how to communicate. And I like them. They are great people. But... My friend Drac is a wonderful engineer. He's very good at communicating. He is incredibly rare. Seriously, that man is one in a million. My sister is also very good at communicating. I know how rare she is. I know she's not paid or treated as it because, again, she's chosen to go the academic route and she's always... She's chosen to do things like work with foundation year and try and do teaching and help the students who come from tough backgrounds to get ahead and she does all that which is very fulfilling and wonderful for her to do but it's not financially lucrative she's not paid what she's worth and i know that because i also know the companies which try to headhunt her So, you're, say, you're blaming short-sighted politicians. Well, I'm blaming the quality of politicians we get these days because politicians, being a politician is considered to be a bad thing. When actually, being a politician, i.e. playing politics in the office and all those things, can be a good thing because it's communications. It's whether you use those skills for good or not. And if you are good at what you do, if you do not, if you purposely say, oh, I don't get involved in the politics... And I skew to politics. And then you complain, oh, I've, the people that are in charge of me don't know what they're doing. You have no one to blame but yourself. Because if you're very good at what you do, usually you don't have to play much politics. Because you already do good things. And that's one of the things that, you know, you can always tell when you're facing, when you've got good politics involved in scenarios, because you have a policy debate. The moment you have a debate over personalities and not a debate over policy, that tells you not just one side's in trouble, but both sides are in trouble. You know, any debate, if they're debating personality over policy, they've got problems. Because that means neither of them has a policy between them. And that's the thing, because if you can debate policy, you're going to win. 
So if you're good at what you do, you can debate, you can project policy. In which case, you have the strong position for politics. And whether it's office politics, local politics, corporation politics, national politics, whatever level. If you are good at policy and you are good at communicating it, you will win. So please... Go and get involved. If you're good at what you do, if you're good and you understand it, then go and get involved. Be part of the change. Don't sit there complaining on the side when you don't see the change. And yes, please note, one of the other things you learn from politics is to compromise. And that's actually essential because here's the thing. Your personal view on something is very important to you. And that's always the case. What you personally like and dislike is going to be a factor. But if you cannot persuade on that one the vast majority of people to agree with you, then just don't talk about it. And don't try and change it. Wait until either the world changes with you or make the case in a slowly measured way. Slowly move the debate. Again, there's a lot of lessons of history of that being far more successful than trying to radically change things straight off. Human race is a very slow turning ship. You try and grab the wheel and make a radical change, you will end up in trouble. It won't work. It's an oil. It's a. It's. It's an oil tanker. It's an ultra large crude carrier. It's a. You will turn the wheel, frantically, but it will take a long time before it starts to turn. And while you're doing that, it's going to look like you are absolutely insane. Sorry, that's... I know I'm not supposed to use that word, but it's going to look like you shouldn't be in, at the wheel. Go Do it slowly, measuredly, and people will follow you. Gordon Smith. Be fair, Falkland's mainly down to the Foreign Office. Poor and no advice to number 10. Royal Navy only needed, uh, needed when we went uh, want a cocktail party or after deck of a frigate act. Uh, on Whitehall wanting to finish early on Friday to get down to the Shires and post the Stanley's equivalent to the death sentence. Better just to make smoothing no uh, soothing noises to the islanders and gradually let it drift over the argies. Swinton chaps, wine, beef, and uh, plenty of uh, banqueters. Yes, Prime Minister. Minister, Prime Minister had them spot on. Yes and no. The Falklands is a little bit more complicated than that, but sadly not much more complicated than that. It's basically, that's a very simplified and comedic approach to what is pretty much the story in more nuance. Colonel, uh, Colonel Alvacal, the only reason the 2nd Pacific, Pacific Squadron made it to Tsushima to begin with was an inordinate supply of binoculars and a very, very good commander. I say, everyone, and Knights say, everyone, if you are going to cheat on a naval treaty, do it properly. Yes. I say, everyone, and uh, yeah, the Terence is always the first target of the British government politician. Um, yeah, I honestly call them the question if they want a foreign power to invade or something. Not really, they just don't think. Again, the trouble is, you've pointed out short-term politicians, and I know I've done a bit of a rant about politics, but the point is, again, the people who keep getting in politics are good at politics, and that's all they're good at. And you really need people who are good at politics and good at something else as well. And yes, we've always had a fair, uh, you've always had a fairly healthy crop of politicians in any country who were literally only good at politics. But it's rare in history that they make up the entirety of a political structure. In fact, it's usually a first sign of problems in terms of what is going to happen when that is the case. I say in night six eight for one. Ideology ruins everything. Mm. 
my own views on ideology I've made clear in the past. I, I sort of uh, I love ideology as a starting point for a debate. It's a nice thing for a starting point of debate. But if I'm going to make a decision on something, I want to look at the facts and all the options, and I don't care which side of the debate the options, uh, the fa uh, the idea and uh, thing comes from, as long as it's the one which best fits the scenario you're in, which is going to be down to context and nuance and facts. Doesn't matter whether it's from the left or the right, if it may. To quote a Chinese philo uh, philosopher and leader at one point, doesn't matter if the cat is black or white, as long as it catches the mice. Ultimately, if it does it, it does the job you want it to do, in the way you want it to do it, does it matter whether the idea comes from which side or the other? And the other problem with ideology is, of course, people start looking for ideological purity. No. Nothing is worse for a democracy than people seeking ideological purity. The whole point of a democracy is you're supposed to be able to have ideas which can disagree with each other. Like a human being can maintain more than one idea in their head, a democracy needs to be able to maintain more than one idea in its head as well. The cruel irony after night six eight one. The cruel irony after nineteen thirty one. The five the aft five in five and a half inch magazine was left empty. So if it had not been converted into a four inch magazine with an empty magazine hole between the four inch AA magazine and the fifteen inch magazine, once the four inch magazine fire breaches the empty magazine hold, the fire has nothing to feed it, and once Hood completed a turn, cold seawater would be flooding into turbine room three, and four inch magazine plus the one fifteen inch magazine is ammo as ammo removed from it in the battle. Um, there are a few options. There are a few options for what might have happened. It's one. It's again those thing of if the three remaining admirals had been converted to carriers rather than courageous and glorious, as I'm fairly sure was looked at. I can't really a hundred percent prove it. But there's enough circumstantial evidence in the phraseology, especially around Ark Royal's construction with Camel Laird, that that is the only option which makes any set kind of logical sense. Then I think you'd be dealing with a different world, because they would have been bigger, faster, and you would have probably wanted to upgrade Hood, Renown, and Repulse earlier in the cycle, so you could would have those very fast task forces, especially once you had Ark Royal join. So you basically you would have been built, Ark Royal would have been your first, well, if you had two or if you got three all constructed but probably two under the treaty system but if if you got two under constructed the treaty system and then Ark Royal join them later on that would have been three task forces each made around an Admiral class, uh, either an Admiral class battle cruiser or Admiral class carrier, and renowned Repulse and Arc Royal. So, and you would have probably seen one sitting in Indian Ocean, one sitting in the Home Fleet, and one sitting in the South Atlantic somewhere as your sort of hunting groups. So, uh, your sort of your groups to try and engage. And track down surface raiders. Could be interesting. Night Tigran, if the British had better aircraft, then uh, Spark and Prince Yuri are going to face a torpedo and dive bomber attack, which definitely slows them down. Yeah, it would have done. Their aircraft were quite good. It was just, it's need you need another aircraft carrier there. I said, yeah, the saying, if you have it flaunted, I think, fits it, don't you agree, Doc? It does in deterrence. It doesn't if you are trying to rub the fact you're rich in the face of some people, but deterrence, in deterrence between nation states, it, there is no point having a capital asset that you do not admit to having as a capital asset. It's like people going, oh, but we have secret doomsday weapons. Well, they can't deter the conflict, any conflict if they're a secret. They really can't. That's the whole point. Why do you think, despite the the, the sheer power, yes, there is some secrecy around 
the ballistic missile programs, etc. But even the Soviet Union, one of the tightest states known to mankind, and modern China, and even North Korea, leak like a sieve when it comes to admitting their nuclear program exists and they have the weapons. Why? Because if no one knows you have them, they don't deter anything. There's enough, enough, several conversations on politics. Uh, Night Aaron, the Japanese and the fall of Singapore in early 1942. That is definitely some kind of epic blunder. But I'm not sure if it's army, navy, or what it is. That's politi that, that's combined operations, and I was looking at epic naval blunders, basically. Andrew Cox, Medway was an epic blunder. Stupid and careless by the British and underestimating their opponent and overestimating their dominance combined with an epic counter by the Dutch to exploit it. No, but that's because I put Medway as down as the other side doing really well, rather than, and especially in terms of the intelligence uh, management of that, than the British being completely atrocious. Although the British leadership does have a lot to answer for in falling for it. It's, its losses are epic. And it is certainly a blunder. But I'm not sure if I would call it an epic blunder because the mistake they make is lack of information and not thinking not thinking what that lack of information means. And that's rather too run of mill and normal for humans to do for it to be epic. Sorry. Uh Skippy Africanus. These are always fun. Thank you. My blunders containers, USN resistance to convoying, especially during the U-boat assault on the East Coast, and the RN assumption that Aztec had defeated submarines, RAF control of fleet air on the coastal command, same issue in the US and, uh, with Army contro Navy control of ASW long-range patrolling into war. Lastly, what about deploying Force Z? As said, that would seem to be a devil's container. Sending battlecruisers and battleships without air cover. I think I've covered Force Z to the nth degree. At various points, the reason it was sent... And also the issues of, yeah, they do need an air cover, but that goes back to the carrier decision by Churchill to pause the carrier construction. We just didn't have enough carriers. It made sense if you were only thought you were going to fight the Germans. The moment you're fighting the Italians in the Mediterranean as well, it makes even less sense. It didn't make sense when fighting the Germans due to the fact that the Royal Navy used carriers as part of their anti submarine warfare capability. But leaving that all to one side, it made no sense at all if you were also considering deterring the Japanese. <sighs> because carriers are a force multiplier for capital ships. Skip Africanus, the Battle of Virginia Capes is my answer to query at the end of the video. The French did well. They did. Andrew Cox. You could argue Sleaze, uh, Sleaze was similar to Midway. The French hamstring themselves, but it was a British attack and making the most of the mobility advantage that made it all the, the route it was. Yeah. yeah. Andrew Cox. If Holland had a carrier with him, he would have lost, uh, wouldn't have lost Bismarck in the run-up to the battle, so would have had a different engagement get geometry to the historical one. Yes. That's the thing. If you have two carriers with that fleet, it, let, let's put it this way. You have two carriers suddenly the whole operation d d gets very different in terms of your task forces. If you have two carriers and you have a third King George V class, so Duke of York is ready earlier, so you have Prince of Wales and Hood with a carrier, and King George V and Duke of York with a carrier, as your two hunting groups, then the engagement differentials for good old Bismarck and Prince Jürgen become very, very nasty. Okay. Nice everyone. Is it any wonder why people think America is a declining power if they cannot fight a shipboard fire properly? Then for frigate's sake, this just confers you need an animal fisher to clean up this ship show. Sorry for language. I was listening to part of Bill Trance 107 before bed. Okay. There was a discussion the other day, and this did lead to rather an interesting comment, on declining power. And I don't use that to describe the US. Why? I call them a divided power. There is a reason for this. 
international nations, na nation states are not zero sum games. They're not. One power can rise without another power falling. It's you're looking at the relationships and you're going, oh well, if this one's rising, then this one must be falling. But that doesn't mean it. It can be just this one is stagnant. Stagnant means they're not really doing much and therefore they're staying steady and the others are rising in comparison to them. So it can have an effect of looking like it's declining, but really they're staying steady. Divided power means that they're not rising because they're spending so much time internally fighting and concentrating internally. So they're a divided power. And then others are rising as well. Declining power means that they are dropping in status in terms of their capabilities, their funding, their development, and all these things. America is not a declining power. At they are a divided power. And please note, this is one of the things I have, why I have fun. When people go, oh, you, why don't you use that? Uh, to paraphrase this other comment. You, your, your refusal to reuse this shows you this, that, and the other. No. I'm sorry, I'm PhD war studies. I have actual accreditation in international relations. I have a master's in international conflict. I have a bachelor's in history. I have all these things. I am going to use the correct phraseology because this is what I do for a living. I make this advice. I go and talk. So if I call someone a declining power, that means they fit the perimeters of what we call a declining power. If I call someone a divided power, that is what they call because they fit the perimeters of a divided power. If I call them a stagnant power, that is because they fit the perimeters of a stagnant power. Britain at various points before it became a declining power was a stagnant power. Please note that. It was one of the most powerful nations in the world, but it was stagnant. You can be divided, you can be stagnant. There are all sorts of definitions we can use. Because international relations and countries are not zero-sum games. For A to rise doesn't require B to decline. A can be rising and B can just be staying the same for various internal reasons. It changes the relationship between them. It can turn A from being the weaker power to being the equal power to being the stronger power. But it doesn't necessarily. And also, please note, in international relations, it's very difficult to connect, uh, predict which country will rise. Because if you'd asked people in the 1900s who was most likely to supersede Britain as the most powerful nation on state in the world, they probably wouldn't have picked America. Americans might have picked America, but everyone else would have probably picked Germany. So be very very, very careful. And this is the point. People like me are never going to give you the easy answer. We are never going to say... someone. Let, let's put it this way. It would be like going to a car mechanic and going... Right. So the engine's kaput. They're going to explain why the engine's going to put. They're going to have a definition. They're going to tell you, well, no, it's not the engine, it's the gearbox, or it's the valves, or this, that, and the other. They're not going to give you the simple answer, because it's their area of specialism, their area of field. You're asking someone who does it, their uh, the, uh, expert in that field, a question about it. You expect an expert answer. You expect that qualifications. The qualifications of the answer. I don't describe America as a declining power, because they are not. They're also not a stagnant power, because they're not doing what a stagnant power would do, which is just standing still. They're a divided power. The reason they're a divided power is because they're spending more time having internal debates and discussions over issues which are internal and, less to, uh, and not balancing the internal, the external. They're not reaching for something, they're spending their whole time internally focusing and debating. And sometimes powers go through this because they need to work out what they're going to be. Especially when you're a melting pot power. Please note, there's that phrase coming in. Melting pot power. And that means you're a large enough power, you've got multi, you're a multi-ethnic, multicultural group all together. You're trying to work out how you work together, especially while you're in transition. 
So you're going to be a divided power. Powers, when they're rising, tend to be united powers, and they tend to be externally focused. So a power which is a rising power tends to be united. Everyone has a sort of, they have a sort of common political goal in terms of, and they achieve a common political goal, whether through buy-in or force, they achieve it, and then they rise. This is why totalitarian dictatorships often look strong. If we look back in what well, 1920s, 1930s, when people looking at Italy and Germany, all those things, they're looking at strong, they're the future, they're looking at how to rise, look at, because it's very easy, by force, they've got a united country which has a vision, so they're rising, so they look pretty quickly. In contrast, the democracies look messy and divided and stagnant and all sorts of things. They do. But who wins World War II? It's the messy, stagnant, divided democracies. Why? Because when they got united, suddenly all that energy which had been wasted being fighting internally and just being sloth gets reused, gets motivated, gets harnessed and pushed in and suddenly, boom! So, America is a divided power. Andrew Cox, Cold War ship design makes sense, provided you assume that you will always be working with NATO, with NATO force structure. However, it falls down when the politicians won't give up the colonial commitments, which mean you have to operate independently. It didn't even make sense in the NATO force structure. Please don't. I, I, I can understand where you're coming from, but please don't. It didn't make sense then. Uh, the, if you consider the amount of revisions which go through ship design far, immediately after the Falklands War in pretty much every NATO navy, that tells you the story that the, the assumptions that were being made, and they were basing the things on assumptions, based on assumptions, based on assumptions, based on assumptions, had gone a long way away from the reality of the world we live in. Andrew Cox, Falklands was a political bundle, not a naval one. Dan Freeman, war is politics by an openly and by a more openly violent means. Dan Andrew Cox, yes, but don't blame the Navy for a political incompetence that caused the war. Yes, but you can blame the Navy for failing to make anyone listen to their advice. And also, remember, the Navy in many ways provides advice on the structures. So yes, you can you can blame the Navy, but you could also say the Navy just wasn't good at playing the politics at this point. And that means you need some Whitehall warriors. You do need officers who are good at politics as well as good at being naval officers. They are rare and difficult to raise up, but you need them. Marcus Francionium, you give me a lovely whole discussion on the Batvian Republic and on various admirals involved, and I love it, but I'm probably not going to read it now because it's given me an idea for a video. So that's why I'm not reading it. Galsman 13, Dr. Clark. Across countless centuries, he has seen civilizations manifest and crumble. Truly none last, arrogant empires, everyone content in their belief, only they merit a place among the seas, dogs chasing conquest, glory, even faith. Haha, <laughs> he has seen servants of entropy existing only to spread their malice from one sea to the next, merciless agents of disorder committed to the annihilation of all they once stood for. Seekers of depravity... Force of crude savagery, he has watched beleaguered nation, uh, populations of dying countries struggle tirelessly in the futile pursuit of betterment or prosperity or survival, and yet no matter how fleeting their existence is, he welcomes all to the place in his carefully curated collection. Ha ha ha. Hmm. To an extent. To an extent. Um, I'm presuming... Yeah, I know where that quote comes from. There is truth in that. Don't ever think there's an end of history. Don't ever think that we know everything. I, the, the people I have the most fun with are people who start saying, oh, well, this is all we can do now scientifically, so we can't, couldn't do that. And you sit there and go, A, who says we're right about all the stuff we know? We could be wrong were right for the level of right we are available to achieve, and now. But also, who 
who says what we're going to learn next? Think about how quickly the world has evolved in the last 150, 200 years. Imagine how quickly it could evolve in the next 200. Do what? This video is also not available less than, at less than 360p. Hmm. I have no idea what's going on. I record currently in 190 by 1080 at, and sit on the recorded videos at 60 frames per second as a rule. Um, YouTube doesn't always like the 60 frames per second, so sometimes I re-record at 30 frames per second. And I always did lies at 30 frames per second because it just saves on bandwidth. But it's interesting. Um, the next video, the next camera I'm getting is capable of up to 4K. And the reason I'm doing that is because basically I fancy having the ability to do some for some in 4K when they need to be in 4K. Uh, for example, some of the book review stuff. When I do book reviews, I think 4K will probably get the fine detail of the print better. But that's about the only real one I'm sort of looking at. And I'll probably do that, at 4K, uh, that at 4, in a 4K at 30 frames per second. Ethan McKinney, I'd argue you can commit a blunder and still win. You can. It's a version of period victory, as you point out. Colin Gansworth, well, war's largely won by economy and logistics, which allow you to blunder more than your opponent. Also, a stupid move can be so unexpected that it results in the opponent acting even more stupid. True. Dan Rim, the issue with arrogance of the overly smart people is they often forget they forget that other people are not necessarily going to make the same decision prioritising things to them. To use the example of your friends in London, they do not think anyone would be desperate stupid enough to try to mug them. They fail to factor in that for someone, their needs are so desperate that the risk of a quick mugging down a dark alley will help them reach their goal. Yes. Plus, they're a bit stupid. Uh, ship for the most part, uh, that ship for the most part cannot make a mistake. Only a few ships have sufficient agency to influence things like this. Ships like Warspite of World War One, Two, and USS Enterprise probably have that level of agency. I wonder whether Prince Jurgen threw other ships under the bus to save itself repeatedly. Um, ask Bismarck. That room. The end question. Not an epic blunder, but an epic win. Were good planning, preparation, consideration, mitigation for worst kind of scenarios act. The whole of Operation MB8, including the Battle of Toronto in November 1940. Hmm. Battle of Midway, and Operation Overlord, Neptune, June 1944. Yeah. Michael Lalanza. The Japanese were in no sense building Yamamoto and Mushashi as deterrents. They are meant as unpleasant surprise to Americans in the battle line in the decisive battle of a war with America. Mm, not if you actually read the, some of the Japanese documents. There is a debate. There are some who are, do see them as that. They do see them as just that. But if you read... Especially the works and oh, of the last admiral I did of the Japanese um, Axis commanders. Let me remember his name. Chief of Staff, Axis Navies. Common response. Good lord, that was like so many of those. Not Ernesto. Um, Mitsumasa Yon. Uh, Mitsumasa Yonai. Um. And he was quite important at their conception. It was very much a deterrence asset. But that's, again, part of the problems in Japan is the Navy is just as divided as the Navy Army in terms of feuding groups. And they have different views. And they do fight. And try and kill each other over these things. But, yeah, deterrence was the, uh, why one section was supporting them. Because, again, they couldn't build to match in numbers. They want to deter. No one, uh, quite a few, you have to remember the Japanese didn't actually want to fight a war of America. Most of them did know what would happen if they did fight a war of America, what the likely result would be. So they didn't want to fight that war. They didn't want to. So it was a case of how do you prevent that war? There were some who were so divine right of kings, emperors, and all that stuff, that they actually thought they could win it, but most of them were sensible and realised they couldn't. 
Dan Dream, also an end, alternative end question. Some of the other naval-related epic blunders. Not seizing Antwerp and approaches in autumn 1944, when the opportunity first presented itself. Doing so would create a much stronger logistical link for the Allies, and I think it would have been a far better operation to have conducted and done than the historical Operation Market Garden. Possibly. Early World War II, the British and the French decision making made during the Fernie War. This was the moment to engage the German, when, in, to engage the German industry when it could be done. From for the RAF forward bases in France, with things like mi the mining, the German inland waterways and harbors. Harbors. Hope the RAF will be able to hit the water, even if they could often miss the city right, right city and sometimes right country at night. No, they did quite well hitting waters. They did a few operations like that. Uh, this will also uh, allow them to block the supply of iron ore to factories from Sweden without involving neutral countries, and civilian deaths will be limited, allowing a degree of control over things like the U.S. popular reaction to remain positive as it was, or something fairly neutral. Allies had the advantage that British industry should be relatively safe even if Germans retaliated against the French, while the Germans could probably not expect the same level of support from recently occupied Czechoslovakian industry. It was certainly interesting. Uh, that room, oh, one other blunder. The Generation 2.0 armoured carriers being built with low clearance in the hangars. I think Jamie might actually agree with this. By the stage they were ordered and at relatively early stage of construction, it was clear that the aircraft being ordered for the fleet air arm were going to grow the Barracuda or Supermarine Torpedo Bomb. Equally, the interaction of radar, not available and confirmed as effective in 1937 when the Illustrious and Dominator were ordered, was known by 1939. Finally, the weight limits were gone and the trials of drawing data from Mark Royal were available, showing that she was overpowered so they could have grown. Especially given the pauses for implacable and impactable construction, building to that design with small lifts for longer, low hang clearance is hard to justify. I expect James from Armour Carriers is now sticking his drop bear assassins on me if I ever may make it back to Australia. Uh, it's the kangaroo assassins you have to really watch out for. The drop bear assassins are safe for very special people. But I think he'd actually agree with you on this one. Let's explain for one. Armoured Carriers animal assassins don't scare me. That's because you haven't come face to face with them. Those kangaroos are massive. Ethan McKinney, Guadalupe. The pet is halfway through to that and pay. The gua has a such a frog name. Hua. Guadalupe. Guadalupe? Guadalupe? Eh? Guadalupe? Hmm. Um, nice to everyone. Well, that was a fatal error judgment for the Junters. While the British have less, they are trained, better trained. Hmm. And they didn't have that much less. Tim Conroy. Every time Camperdown and your way of describing Duncan's approach to disgruntled sailors comes up, it makes me grateful that his name is still carried in the fleet today. Yes, it was kind of a unique methodology of ensuring that you maintained control. I will dangle you over the side by your neck. Anyone else want to try this one? No, you're going to leave me in command of my ship? That's good. You will have better things to do than to have an argument with me. That's even better. Notice I am not hiding behind marines or officers or anyone else. I am standing in front of you all. Yeah. There are times when you just decide that there are better things to be than the other person who comes and tries to take on Duncan at that point. Because <laughs> he will drop him and go straight for you. Epic, Andrew Cox, Epic Blunders. The French at the Battle of the Nile. If you're going to block Lambert's side, block it. Spanish Armada, set out of, uh, sent out of arrogance without the understanding that capabilities of the opponents were. Uh, Savoan, the Spanish Armada almost succeeded. It was, it was mainly the issue was actually, I would say, the communications between them and the army in Netherlands and the fact that they needed them to meet up. Uh, Savon, the complacency, uh, complacency Allied cruiser force led to their downfall. I can't really argue with that one, seeing as I've said pretty much the same thing. Uh, force Z, not sure if this is naval or political, but why send such a small force into a war with the third largest state of the planet? Uh, the idea was it being deterrence. Um, far better would have been to send the Isles with them as it happened historically afterwards anyway. Please go watch my videos on this topic. I have done extensive videos on Force C and what needed to be done to make it sensible. And basically it's send a carrier if you have one spare, and combine with the R's, and base it out of Ceylon, that's in sort of modern Sri Lanka, of course, until you need them there, and then deploy them forward. Basically, put them in a safe spot where they are a threat to anyone attacking Singapore, or anyone attacking Australia, but where you can't get to them without first taking Singapore. So basically... 
you have to go for them. And then they could turn up at Singapore and go boom, boom, boom with their guns and go, oh, you were sending a ground assault on Singapore, really? Meet 15-inch hail fire. Josh Wright, a really great video. Thank you for putting this together. I especially enjoyed how you went back so, so far in time to cover ancient and pre-modern battles. That's what I like doing in this channel. I like to do everything. For me, I might add the IGN's Operation MI to the Stupid Blunder category in World War II, and the USN's Slow Response Operation Drumbeat, and the RN's Squandering of Prince of Wales and Repulse to the Careless Blunders category. I would, but I've done the 4C so many times, I'm not going. I didn't want to add it to the video. 96A from The British plan to kill Yamoto would be the same plan they used against Bismarck. No. And I know I answered this in the, lo in the brew ships, but I'm also going to do this here. The reason it's not the same plan as killing the Bismarck is be uh, as they killed, uh, as they would, as they used against the Bismarck. It's quite simple. Bismarck came out alone. If it had come out with Tirpitz, you'd have then seen a different uh, force. The Japanese, if they were sending out Yamoto, it was unlikely to be coming out alone. It might well be with Mashashi. It could co conceivably be with several other battleships as well. It was going to be a fleet-on-fleet -fleet engagement. That means you would need to significantly outnumber it. Or you would need to significantly weaken them with air attack. So let me get into how Yamoto would have been engaged. It depends. What ships does the RN have with them? If they have the King George the Fifths and Vanguard, then they have 15-inch, 14-inch guns and they have a speed. If they have Renown as well there, that also gives them another fast unit, which they've upgraded, and probably some of the water, some of the Queen Elizabeths will be there as well. The idea they would probably go with is airstrike to try and damage as many ships as well. They'd like to do basically do a run of Matapan. That is the battle plan they would go with. Airstrike and then move in to engage at night. When they'd hope, especially their radar, would give them an advantage. That is how they would deal with Yamoto. Whereas if you consider with Bismarck, the reason they're doing that is because that would be a fleet engagement. It With Bismarck, they can easily outnumber it. With Yamoto, it's going to depend on how many ships the British have available that day versus how many the Japanese have available that day. But remember, the Japanese have a lot more battleships to draw from than the Germans do. The Germans never have really available more than two at any one time. And two coming out together is the British nightmare. If they managed to get more than two together... You would have had, there would have been had to be a far larger force organized. Britain would have had to call in more ships from various other duties. That's the reality of it. It really is. Christopher, from what I've read regarding Spithead versus Norm, men looking to protect their rights as Englishmen versus uh, A to use Montage, much more Red Mutiny and Nor. There were differences between Spithead and Nor, and Nor was interesting. Wayne's World of Science and Technology. Uh, since around 1900, any nation which started a war of conquest and ended up losing. Going to war for purpose of conquest seems to have been the big, become the biggest blunder of all. Excellent, work as usual. I keep seeing parallels between these examples and what is playing out in both Ethiopia and Ukraine, especially with regards to logistics. That's one of the reasons I'm st most stuck with the Royal Canadian Navy's choice of the Leonardo. Blunders. Mm, the Leonardo is actually quite a good gun. It is a good gun. Uh, it's quite reliable. I think that's probably what they've gone for. They've gone for one of the most reliable guns on the market. Rather than maybe going for the best or the most advanced technologically. And there are many different shell options you can go for for the Leonardo, and which are in development, which have multiple allied and multiple partners they can, they can team up with to develop it. Um, the BAE gun system might have been more sensible from teaming up with the Americans and the British perspective, but the Leonardo is also uh, does have many other options, and the Canadians do like to preserve a level of independence, so I can see why they've gone for the Leonardo. 
The choice of building a single class of 15 major surface commands was genius, in my opinion. I, yes, I would prefer if I was... It, it's going to sound strange again. 15 I can understand, but you have to remember that you haven't yet got to the sort of the whole fouring. So you're basically going to say 8 one side, 7 the other side of Canada. In which case, I'd have preferred 16 to have equal numbers both sides. And I'd have set up the main facility so that you could support each squadron of eight on each side. As to your homework, I think the Caritas actions during the Battle of Samara are unfairly criticised. The fight that Tappy Free put up would have converted, convinced anyone that they were facing a larger, far larger force. Nee. I do agree to that to an extent. Criticisms of Jellico for Jutland are also unfair. The intelligence limitations let him blind for portions of battle. Doesn't help when the guy in charge of your reconnaissance is BT, who doesn't feel like communicating. Spanish Armada is another case where an intended victim fought like a maniac and got an assist from the weather. weather. True. Uh, recent, uh, biggest recent blunder is ongoing in Ukraine. A plan that was unrealistic and flexible, doomed to failure, but so darn costly in lives and lost, lost and people traumatised that I want to get Putin... <laughs> Put it into a medieval torture chamber for a few hours to test the implements on him. That seems... Well, I can understand it. But, yes, to be fair, as I've said before in Ukraine, it's the rules of six. Six hours, six days, six weeks, six months, six years. We'd all prefer it not to be the six-year option. But that's where it's now heading. Which is going to be problematic, because it's going to change a lot of things. Anton, 1860. From what I know, historical knowledge of Battle of Cities is very incomplete and mostly from English sources. I would not be surprised if the account of this English victory was largely embellishment, just as the victory of the Battle of Agincourt was. Okay, well, there are actually quite a lot of French sources on it and um, when I first responded to you I couldn't remember the name of the person who it was um, because I, although I've there are because of my own response was actually there are pretty good French ones well they're concentrated on the English translations as my medieval French is definitely not up to the task basically commanders seem by all accounts to have built themselves up a nice little logic wall that turned out how they expected the, Engli uh, the English to attack into how they would attack then storms wrecked their positioning thanks to the chains, and the English attacked in a suboptimal manner for the uh, a suboptimal ma optimal manner for the local geography, but actually turned out to be very good for the position of the French were in. In fact, I'd argue Jean Frossin is the uh, probably the most critical uh, source for understanding the French side and the entire battle. Although Jan de Klerk's uh, poem is also very pretty useful. Yeah, uh, actually, most of the sources are French and. Dutch, we'd sort of call from their rough areas of geography in modern times. So, yeah, no. And Jean Frossat is actually far more critical of the French commanders than the English sources are. And I would argue that's probably because the French expected to win. They had the bigger force, they had experienced officers, everything was set up, they should win. And they lost. So, no. Battle of Sleaze is mm, actually pretty accurate. Battle of Agincourt. Trouble is, that's become so part of mythologized on both sides, it's kind of difficult to really go through. And you have lots of various people reporting what their parents and their grandparents and everything said. I know. So that's an interesting battle to get into. But I have a friend who specialises in the Battle of Argencourt. And when it comes around again, I might see if I can get them to do a video on that one. To go through all the actual history and all the debates on it. And where the archers were put. Because we don't really understand that battle. Nick Vorvadon. Hello, haven't seen you in a while. That's a question. 
Thanks for the video, Doctor. For the question, I think I think France declared a war on Prussia in 1870 might be such a situation, mainly because they underestimated how fast Prussia and its allies can mobilise their troops. Yeah, people are always underestimating how fast other people can mobilise their troops. It's a consistent perennial failing. Anyway. Thank you for that. Thank you for all the comments. I like comments. They really do make my life a lot more fun. Sad, uh, sadly enough, I should probably have a social life, but no, I have comments instead. That's my social life. Thank you very much for watching. Take care, and I um, hope you had a good day. And hope you had a nice Saturday, when this comes out. Hang on, no, Friday. Friday. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care, and thank you for all your support. It makes all this viable.